Welcome everyone to Stories to Share, the third speaker in our third season. My name is Joe Steinfield and I am the moderator of this series. How many of you are here for the first time? Welcome. Excellent. I hope you'll come back. Uh, in future months, it's the first Friday of each month, and as you can see, our sponsors are Bell Tets and the Savings Bank of Walpole. Today we have a remarkable person as our speaker, a man named Dan Scully. Many of you know Dan. And I spoke with Dan earlier in the week and I asked him, as I often do, would you do it again? which is to say architecture, and he said, yes, I would. And no wonder, because I took a look at his resume, and although I hate cliches, you could choke a horse on this, <laughs> on this resume. He has become a fixture in this region, and I mention that because you can't turn around in the Monadnock region without running into something that has Dan Scully's imprint. There's a wonderful book called Monadnock Summer, The Architectural Legacy of Dublin, New Hampshire, by William Morgan. I only know about it because my wife, Virginia, insisted that I look at it, and I'm glad I did. It features many of Dan's uh, works. Uh, among other things, and he has his imprint not just on Dublin, but throughout the area. One interesting thing I learned from reading about Dan is that he doesn't, doesn't just dabble. He gets into various areas of architecture in real depth, and he has been recognized. I won't read them all, but there are 36 honors and awards listed in this write-up, many of which are from the American Institute of Architects uh, and including uh, a, an award from the New Hampshire branch of the New Hampshire Institute of Architects as basically the outstanding architect of our state. Uh, he's been everywhere, uh, but he chose to be and remain here. And so we will hear from him, we will get to see many of his works. We're in for a treat and think about questions that you'd like to ask because we will reserve some time for that. It's a pleasure to introduce Dan Scully. Admit it's hard to stand up after that. <laughs> um, I don't know what you're expecting. Uh, if you're expecting travels with Charlie, we're not going to go very far. Uh, we're just going to go around the mountain, um, ignoring most of what architecture is about budgets, clients, all those pieces of architecture. Um, we're not going to solve any affordable housing projects or any of that, those bigger issues. Um, but when Joe asked me to talk, which shocked me, I hadn't thought about even talking, he said, what he, he immediately demanded, what, am I, what are you going to talk about? And obviously I had no idea because I hadn't thought about it. Um, but it seemed obvious that a good way to sort of sum up some of the work we've done around the mountain um, as just how, how to pay homage to the mountain through our buildings. Um, that's sort of where I'd like to start, um, but it's, but architecture is many things and, um, and we're just pick, we're gonna talk a very small piece of it. Um, and it's, and I, these are all, sites that have had 
you know, focus on the mountain, and most of our work does not uh, have that op opportunity. Um, but, and that'll probably be the last of the cars, and probably people, most of the people who know me expect nothing but cars. <laughs> um, and I expect a clicker to work. Is there something, Ed, something I'm meant to do? Thank you. Um, I was very lucky as a 14-year-old, uh, tagged along in Greece um, when my dad was studying the relationship between temples and the, and the mountains, the mountains and the temples um, and the earth. And you could say it all, everything that I talk about today sort of relates back to that. Um, this is the Temple of Pestamen, um, Temple to Hera, which uh, a, a female goddess, and it's so clearly aligned with a female shape in the landscape, and that is what the temples did, because the Greeks believed the gods lived in the mountains, and so um, they visually tried to connect, and that's what I'm interested in, is the architecture connecting to the landscape, um, and how you do that. Um, this one is, is just a very axial connection. Very interesting, that the Greeks also, um, Maybe the shepherds went on the mountains, but the Greek, most of them didn't because the gods lived there and it was, you didn't prod there. Um, it's not working even with the projector. Um, oh. <laughs> you know what generation I'm from. Um, there's so many uh, myths that are, and cultures that have been around the mountains. Uh, Machu Picchu, uh, the, the, their creation myth is that, that they were born on an, on an, in a cave, on a mountain, on an island, in a lake. And the site does much of recreating that. And the architecture is really a tribute to that, making that connection, making that homage to the, in the landscape. Um, right up there, um, that works. The Aztecs had exactly the same uh, creation myth, in a cave, born in a cave on a mountain, on an island, in a lake. And Lake Tequitaca, which is, became Mexico City, is a, a lake on, with an island, and in the middle, uh, they created man-made mountains. And they, their way of doing homage to that was to architecturally c connect and imitate uh, the landscape. Um, this is the island in the middle of that lake. There are so many cultures that are, are built around the, sanctuary, the homage to mountains. And this is, you can see Buddhism, the many religions have <coughs> find that as an, an object that's in, in culturally important to them. I asked a, a Buddhist monk, um, about that mountain, and he said, um, "We don't, we don't go up that mountain. We go around it, and our ceremony is to go around the mountain. Um, again, you don't go there."
this is a generational problem. Um, this is Fuji and Aetna. Um, a, an Everest Sherpa said, in every mountain the earth, there is a goddess. And, and it is our responsibility to keep the goddess happy. Mountains before, uh, months before I start an ascent, I start to worship, start worshiping it and ask for forgiveness because I will have to put my feet on her body. I'm gonna spend more time with this clicker. Um, it's a very curious that the shape of Mananak is almost the same as the shape of uh, Fuji. Um, and one of Jaffrey's treasures is Chris Maya, and this is his painting of, of, uh, of Mananak. Um, the Abernaki Indians felt the evil spirits and the storms were gathered on the, on the mountain and terror and respect for the, for, they had terror and respect for the weather gods. They, they revered the mountain also by staying away, by cer ceremoniously proceeding around it. It must be more of a trick than I've got. Ed, can you just, can, when I just nod, can you advance them? Uh, oh, a little fast. Um, this is, most of the views we saw, uh, the, the Chris Myatz is from the south side, and this is from the north side. Um, most of what I will show you is our project from the north side in the Dublin side. Um, before getting into that, it's what's important to me is back to that first Greek slide, and that is how to move your eye, how to connect from things that are larger than yourself to the landscape. Um, these are two examples of projects we've done where the building actually warps in, in plane, and that that helps your eye move. This was this was actually a tribute to a, a lost partner. Um, there were two pilots who lived here, and one of them didn't make it back once. And so I did addition tribute, like the two planes just veering off in their own directions. Um, um, and many of you have probably seen the Petrofina, where, whoop, now, now it advanced. Anyway, the Petrofina arch that, um, back? yeah, right, this is fine. Yeah. Okay, next one. Um, one way you, you move your eye is to have a focus, and that is uh, an axial direction through a building. Some of you may remember the version I did of the Sharon Art Center where the, the gallery was on Grove Street, but we opened it right up through through the Sharon Art shop all the way out to Depot Square. So that when you came in, you the light of the other side drew you in. So this colonnade led, led you through, whether it was in section or down, but it was all that moving through. Okay, thank you. Um, a, an early uh, project was an addition to the Nelson School, and I really liked the single gable of the old old uh, classroom. No windows, no nothing, a very abstract gable. And, I, and they had had in the 50s an addition on the left uh, and the addition we had to do was a whole lot bigger, so it actually was it set up an imbalanced condition. 
And one way you make an imbalanced condition feel more balanced is to have it feel like it's moving. So it took on the form of the little engine it could um, and with a few round windows and it, it became a dynamic train car moving through. Um, next. Um, there was a big town meeting about whether to vote this in or not and uh, it went up and down in terms of the emotions and Phil Jirasi, who some of you may remember, uh, was a toy maker and he said, we don't have a train, it's just passing through. <laughs> so he got the idea just right. Um, I like this image here of which basically to make something dynamic it has to be in contrast to something that's static. And so this Houston station in uh, London sort of embodies both. One, two, my, okay. Um, the last of the vehicular images here, uh, probably our best building is in Bellows Falls. It's a visitor center. Um, and if you know Bellows Falls, there's a wonderful Main Street court. Uh, there are two streets that, that converge and come together to make a dynamic center. And we were asked to do an interpretive center for Bellows Falls. So we took that same geometry and used it as one, one axis being the train and the other axis being the river with the with recreating the arch bridge that had New Hampshire had torn down. They never let me forget that. New Hampshire had torn it down. Um, so it starts out as a snowplow train and morphs its way into train station Probably what's most important about this project was that, and is what I really like to do with architecture is do something that has some meaning. And this brought back the history of the town. They had the money for the, for the building, but they didn't have the money for, for the arch. They would not let it go. They were, this is a threadbare town. And they, were, they insisted on finding the money to do the arch because that's what really brought the, brought back the history. Um, and it's so important to them that made the telephone book. <laughs> um, a little farther afield, we're not at Manana yet. Um, in the University of Michigan, some of you may know they're very serious about their football. <laughs> Uh, they're also very serious about their march, marching band for the football. So they have their own dedicated field, full-size field, um, and they needed a conductor's platform um, to, and one thing, the thing I really liked about what they, the marching band does, I don't care about the formations. I like the way, the, the transition between the formations when they just sort of all meld to become something else. Um, so the frame for ours is sort of that dynamic, unresolved moments uh, in between the transitions. Turned out the big, our biggest problem was how to, this was the symbol of the University of Michigan and it wasn't given to me as the original problem, but then it became the problem was how to protect that when the University of Ohio came. <laughs> um, back one, sorry. Um, when we all think of LA's, we, we tend to think of something like this, Greek, I mean Italian, LA, and in LA again, or Axis has a destination uh, from the entrance to the entrance to the house. Um, we did a, a building for the College of the Atlantic and being about the college, about the Atlantic, we set it up on a site that 
you could approach the building, but go through it. it the building was entirely open in the center. You, you got up to the center and you saw the Atlantic Ocean. And, and that's really sort of a, a takeoff from the casino in Narragansett where you drive through. Um, a whole nother talk is that I, sort of a fascination of, of buildings along the road and how the road actually goes through. Um, but thankfully the road doesn't go through Manhattan. Um, this is a visit of center we did in Englewood, in New Jersey. Um, and it was on the, in Englewood they had, a, a developer had bought a lot of land and carved out all the roads through the woods and then he, the project didn't go through so all the roads were ghosted in. And we had the building straddle one of the roads so the road went right through the building, the path went through the building. So the building really was the gateway to the nature center. Um, so you went through the building, again, you saw your way through. Um, the angle was because it was a solar building and it was oriented toward the sun. But the, that's one of the things I like about the opening of building through the building uh, as a gateway is that it's to lead you somewhere else. It's not the, de the building isn't necessarily the destination. Next. Um, this, a, this was a sm small cottage on Granite Lake and the owners wanted to build a, a new addition to that and a garage and so I used, you, you come down the driveway, you sort of bounce off the garage and you see into the house and see through the house to the, to the lake. Oh. I'm trying to go backwards here. And this is the, the house where you you, you, there's the walkway right through the house. And it was all, it was, even the curve was to bring you in, lead you into that. Um, another house, just before we get to Manadnock, uh, is in, in Hancock. Uh, and it's, it was a log cabin house built in the, I think the 40s. And we were asked to do a big addition, uh, guest rooms, bed, master bedroom upstairs, a study and a screen porch. Um, and there was actually a shed on the building. And we used that shed as the, like the pearl that set up all the other geometry. But you came, you came down about a half mile long road through the woods bouncing off rocks all the way. It just was, and the final rock you bounced off of, you turned and then it was a straight view. We created a view out toward uh, the lake, Nubanusa. Um, and so th the beginning of that view is we did two big chimneys for the studio and for the mess of bedroom all of which were flanking the view out toward the water. Um, and along the way, the destination was the water. But along the way, um, the screen porch was at, the diagonal axis through the site created the geometry of the uh, Lincoln Log screen porch. not far better than anything we do. Or a couple of examples I'd like to show from uh, Cornish. Um, Charles Platt, this is one of the great houses called High Court and the road is out here and the driveway comes in 
and lead you, and you're not sure where, and you're not sure where, and you see, it, you see this house up on the top of the hill, but you don't know that's where you're going. And then the road turns, and you go through a Birch LA, and you still don't know where you're going. And you get to the end of the drive, this part of the driveway, and you abruptly turned and put on this strong axis right toward the building, right through the building. So, you, so the building eye, your eye is led right through to the Connecticut River on the other side. Uh, just a masterful piece of, I would, sorry for the expression, but it's architectural foreplay of, of how to approach a building. <coughs> Um, a little closer to home, and this one actually hurts a little bit. Um, this was a scheme in 1983 for Jaffrey, for your memorial park to the Vietnam War Memorial, um, with your, all your lifeblood has, in a memorial, it's all about the loss of the lifeblood and it, how it went through the, the mills and, and left. Um, And as, as for the park, we tried to do the foundations of a cathedral and axially connect those. So visually, again, the connection was being made across space. Um, and the benches were be the foundations of the cathedral. Um, it's just so it's all very low and very flat to the ground. Uh, unfortunately, it was deemed to be not country enough. Um, Okay, speaking of uh, dreaming of Monadnock, um, um, this is sort of a, a dreamy uh, view of Monadnock. Um, so how do, how do you pay homage to the architecturally? This is probably the weakest of examples, but it's an initial one. Uh, this is more imitation. So there's the mountain. We did a house facing the mountain that had three ridges, and the top ridge is the one with the stone. Uh, the top, the high part of Manana is, as you know, just stone. Um, but it's, it's a interesting question about how you approach the mountain. Today we climb the mountain. Uh, we search out views for, is it, is it our ocean? Uh, is it the excitement of something constantly changing with the weather? It's welcoming and soft and also gathering dark clouds. Um, is it the power beyond the mountain, much like the power of imagination with the ocean? Um, I, I don't have the answers for, for any of that. Another imitation of the mountain. This is a house, um, I think it's on the Jaffrey Dublin line, um, that faces directly toward the mountain. It's a very thin house. It's more a big flat facade. and um, But it's in copying the shape of the mountain and paying respects to it that way. And again, you, you approach through, and then this one, you approach through and you see the mountain. So there's a, nothing subtle about it, it's just there. Um, an, another house that actually had, has a straight view through the mountain, but much more respectful of, of the heritage of this area. Um, it was a house for actually for Alexa Thayer, who's here. The um, front porch is actually the same geometry and as the front porch of the Dublin Town Hall. And while this house was being designed, the great moon window at Loon Point was being torn down. So uh, The, um, the house 
is a rectangular plan, um, but it just, the mount, the landscape, the site suggested it be laid, laid out this way, um, but the, the view to the mountains that way, so that, that angle of the view became sort of the one contrary thing in the house, sort of an angle that made you conscious of looking that way. Um, and here's that front porch, it's very much like the center of the Delvin Town Hall porch. Um, and here's that, the recreation of the moon window, a similar recreation of the moon window that was at Loon Point. So on the very, on the front of the house, you, you get the clue of that shape that's gonna, that reads right through the house to the mountain. Um, I always like the scale of this being much like the tribute to Isaac Newton's view of the world. Um, uh, this is a Harrisville house that um, was lined up. Actually, there had, um, had been a house in this orientation before. That house before had had an L shape. We spread out the house, the new house, and so it's facing directly the mountain, but the entrance was all aligned. When you came in the driveway, you saw right through the house and out to the peak of the mountain. And the Italianate shape of the house had this one anomaly that sort of led your eye to the entrance and through. Um, so, so I sort of liked the, that reinforcing that that through what it's not quite our street that goes through, but like that. Um, Another, uh, this was a Dublin house. Big field facing the mountain. Whoop. Go back. Um, and every, every effort made to frame that view. Um, but as you approach the house, there is the mountain. So. It becomes, you know before you got into the house that is, this is about the mountain. Um, and so the entrance to the house um, leads you, you start, the house is wide, so you, you're not seeing the mountain when you're actually approaching the house. Um, but the entrance is sort of embraces you to bring you into the house and you get a clue of the light on the other side. Um, so in plan, you open the front door, the recessed entrance, and a view out through to the mountain. So there's a repeating shape that carries you through the entranceway to the view to the mountain. This is a, a renovation of a house in Dublin. Um, well, you can see the screen porch is being changed in nature and the, how, the shape, the materials of the house are much more a classic old uh, Mananak region shingle style house. And on that one, um, we did, did a lot to reinforce the entranceway to again for that view straight through. There were things built in this area that we took out so it, it goes right through. And the porch and the mountain. This, this one is very close 
in on the mountain, but you approached it from from the south, so you weren't looking at the mountain at all, and the view to the mountain you achieved that you got in the house. And what the owners wanted to do was to reverse the entrance, have the entrance come in this way, and have us renovate the back of the house into a new front entrance. So that, and, and so again, we took out some pieces in the house so you could see straight through. Uh, so as you come up the driveway, now you see the entrance to the house and you see the mountains at the same time. <coughs> this one is, this is in Temple and it was a 1700s cape, a pre-revolutionary cape and they wanted to do an addition and we the addition sort of angles toward the mountain, you'll see in plan. But I like to think of this as a Frank Lloyd Wright kind of design. Frank Lloyd Wright came according a pre-revolutionary maiden. <laughs> um, so here's that original house and the addition and the, the, the addition here and the addition here. And, it created a courtyard in the middle, and that has a pergola. Um, all of the overlays of the pergola are facing the mountain. So it, it leads your eye toward the mountain rather than uh, yeah, across it. On, in, um, in, up on um, Pac Manadnock, you've got a kind of equal relationship with the mountain. Um, and this house, um, we tried to, the garage takes on the shape of the mountain, the, the port. Port Gaucher is taking on it. The house shape is taking on the shape of the mountain. And you come in the front entrance, and wait a minute, you don't get the mountain right away. Uh, you get denied for a moment. You you get the entrance way, the stair upstairs. You come in, and you have to make a decision which way to go. And there, then there's two routes to the view. Um, and you, w w they each lead through. Um, you, can, you get an idea how big that fireplace is. Person can stand in it. Another where um, the punchline is given before you get there. Uh, is on this site, you're, you're obviously, as you approach it, you're very well aware of the, ha of the mountain. And, and the site is all beautifully cleared to the mountain. Um, so, but again, the house is sort of wide, so you're, not, you're denied the mountain momentarily as you approach it. And a real classic. In that night, reaching shingle style house. But when you come in, you're confronted by a wall, just like in that previous scheme, and you have to go either side. So there's a momentary denial of the of the view, and then you, by the time you go through around either side, there's it's overpowering. It's there. And, um, this is the back of the house. Um, back to Cornish a little bit. Um, 
there are a couple of interesting houses there that um, have a, you could say, a more relaxed relationship to the mountain. This is this is St. Gordon's house. I, I just love the way this tree and that thing works. But this is the screen porch. This is the porch. It's actually uh, this is our St. Gordon's Memorial board meetings. Um, I always sit on this side so I can get this view of everybody and the mountain. Um, and the mountain's off to the side. It's Cutney's off to the side. It's clearly a part of the part of the composition, but the porch is not facing the mountain. Um, Vicar. Um, Trying to go backwards. Um, this is also uh, by Charles Platt in Cornish, and it's a very Italianate house, um, and a fairly formal, uh, a formal open porch. And that faces directly down the valley. And over to the side here is a Scutney. And actually, the Platts are very, uh, were up, very upset a couple years ago when a storm took down most of the trees they had that was a kind of veil for the mountain, uh, in a way special, because it was behind the veil. Um, So the mountain's off to the side when there's a strong axis toward the valley, which is the long view. Uh, Sandy James designed a house in, in Dublin in 1953, uh, a good modernist house that has probably a 300 degree view and <coughs> it's mostly about the view to Boston. Um, but oh, by the way, all over on my shoulder, there's this mountain, and it's a very, it's a, it's a, again a very relaxed relationship with the mountain um, off to the side, but it's very much a part of the composition of the house. Um, also in Dublin, um, uh, Tiadnock. Um, this is a great old house. Uh, had a recessed porch, recessed deck, and we were asked to make a pergola out of that and formalize it and do some stairs. It was, it was high up above the ground. So we did some stairs, but we did we flared them toward the view to the mountain where the main thing here was a view that straight out, which is a view to the valley. That's the pergola we did with the stairs going up. Um, you can see how they, they're angled and off to the side is the mountain. Um, I sort of like to read a, something that Twain spent a lot of time at this house um, and I can't imitate his, his diction. Um, here's that house with the orientation again toward the long view and the mountain is it's a part of it but it's not in your face all the time um, uh, you can probably read this as well as I can but let me read it um, Twain said soaring double hump rises into the sky on its left elbow same thing. That is, is to say, it is close at hand. From the base of the long slant of the mountain, the valley spreads away up to the circling frame of hills. And beyond the frame, the billowing sweep of remote great ranges rise and view and flow 
fold upon fold, wave upon wave, soft and blue, out and unworldly to the horizon 50 miles away. Um, so I think w with that we could click, click or have a, have a drink to the mountain. <laughs> Yeah, well, somebody said Aldworth, so they got it right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Your voice will carry anywhere, Rusty. <laughs> Dan, the last 10 years or so, I've noticed that because of global warming, the forest is growing several feet a year, and it's, it's starting to fill in your yep. views of the mountain. Um, we all beyond my things, control. We all have things against taking down trees. Right. But is that interfering with your architectural uh, concept for the future? I'm thinking of a house like Alexa Fairs where yeah. the forest is just barely, you know, the, the top of the mountain is barely visible. All the rest of it is being blocked yeah. by trees that nobody wants to take down. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know how to help. <laughs> I mean, it, global warming is, we all wish we had some clue to it, um, but the trees have always been growing there. And actually what, I didn't get into it all, and, and I wished I had in this many years of this business, is the garden design. And it's how you, what you carve out of the, out of the woods. and. Um, all this about an axial view through, you want it to lead out across the landscape. You want the gardens to follow, I want the gardens to follow that. Um, I've had very little chance to do that. A lot of the, the Dublin big estates that we've renovated over the years, they've all begged to have the gardens restored at the same time. And there hasn't, that hasn't been the focus that I've been giving a, any involvement with, um, but you're true. Is there things are. Yes, speak loudly, please. So Dan, um, your very first slide sort of addressed the question I was going to ask you, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, when you were 14 and went to Greece with your dad, yeah. What was it like for you as a 14-year-old? to see all of those spaces and the buildings. Well, one always has something of, of complication in dealing with your parents. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I had a camera and he had a camera and I insisted he stopped every time we saw my first Mercedes 300 SL or something like that. <laughs> That's what I was interested in. But it was my way of finding my own thing. But in reality, people ask me one reason I'm an architect. Um, I think at 14 I felt the power of the Parthenon and you have to, when you feel that power you have to deal with it. And I think I'm trying to deal with it some, still. So it was very influential for me and that 
connecting to the landscape is what I think is, is very crucial. You don't always get a chance to do it, but um, so you know I I learned from him, and I also fought him, which is what you have to do when you're growing up. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Dan, uh, in your presentation, uh, I was thinking, if, are you a building architect or are you a landscape architect in the, in, in the old classic uh, Olmstead design? Um, How would you put yourself? I would like to have more Olmstead in me than I have. Um, uh, I, I do buildings, and that's all I'm. That's, that's all what I'm hired to do. So I, but I try and make it connect to the landscape in a way that um, uh, I'd be honored to work with. You know, someone like Olmsted who was taking it further into the landscape. But uh, and my visions often are just beyond the building itself because that's it's a path to something else, and I'm trying to connect that. But, uh, I like your connection in that he, he's not concerned about gardens. He, he wasn't either. Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was the visual yeah. and scenic uh, presentation to create yeah. almost a, a, a spiritual yeah. mystery of the landscape. Right. Yeah. So. I, I'm, I'm uh, weak in, in garden design. I mean, I would like to know more about it, but I don't. Yes. Who wants to win? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to maintain a house either? Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I noticed uh, in quite a few of your uh, wonderful designs that you used high, small, square, or rectangular windows. And it reminded me of Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, because of his houses. But my question to you is, what did those windows mean to you, both as an exterior and as an interior design? Um, the, a lot of design of an ele elevation is reflective of what's happening inside the building and some about how it looks on the outside. Um, and it's all a visual composition you're trying to make that creates a working order. I mean, I can think of one house where there's a low window at the end of the hall, and then there's a high window over the bed. You know, it's working for how that room is working. Um, but also, that was considered on how it worked on the outside. There's a symmetry that was happening with that. Um, frankly, Wright is a big influence. Um, I wish that uh, the buildings I had to do around here, um, I love the fact that I, the shingle style is very appealing to me as a design and it's very appropriate for this region. I would like to have had people more interested in doing more modern things and that's happening more and more now. Um, so, but frankly, right is, you know, was, was formative for me. Among, other, among a lot of other people. Um, he was never my obsession, but, yeah. Other, yes. So, amazing ideas, right? All these ideas for each, each project. Like, how do those ideas come to you when you process the energy? Like, do you drive up to a school and say, they need a train? <laughs> <laughs> The question, I think, is where do you get all those ideas? Um, they are basically from a lot of work. I mean, like the Munsonville School. You don't, you don't know that it's going to be a big piece that way compared to the little pieces there until you start to analyze what the problem is, what the, how, 
where we could even put the building on the site and leave their playground area and stuff like all those pieces. So that was, it was a big site planning project. There was a hill right behind, you couldn't go further back. You had to leave area in the front. It all started to diagrammatically come together, but it, you have to analyze what's happening in those rooms. Um, what's actually generating much of that was um, there was a, found a way through the codes to have, which most schools you can't have windows between the classroom and the hall for fire reasons. Um, but we did the big windows on the front, windows in the hall into the classrooms because we could put exits out each of those classrooms to the back so that in case of fire there was an escape from each room that then freed up the chance to, to do that design also to encourage them being a line of them. Uh, but there, it's, some things come intuitively, but most of them are a struggle. <laughs> Anyone online? I have a question that was pro is prompted by what you just said about school architecture in modern times and how your thinking has changed as schools have become less safe. Um, speaking of the Munsonville School, that was designed in 1990, or built in 1990. Uh, we've been back a couple times, was to do a larger kitchen uh, and things like that, but one specific request was to come back and look at the safety of it where would the refuge areas be in every classroom? So we, we made some changes, so, but we identified what would be the refuge areas. Um, and that was, it was a specific ta task that th this modern times requires. Um, so doing a new school, that would, would have been in the program at this time. Well, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to uh, point out that our next, actually, I got a call today from George Santos. He was available, <laughs> but I told him we were already full. And Mary Islin, if you go upstairs, you can find 16 paintings by her, not just sheep, uh, wonderful paintings. She will be here first Friday of January, a good way to start the year, and we will continue uh, with stories to share. Again, thanks to our sponsors, thanks to Laura Adams, our new executive director, and this is David Beltet, who is the chairman of the board of the Jaffrey Civic Center. Thank you, everyone, for coming uh, on behalf of the Jaffrey Civic Center. And, and to Dan, I have a gift, a token of our appreciation. Uh, I'll come around after and give it to you. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you very much for coming, and I hope you return for some of our other other shows. And I hope you will stay for a glass of wine, a bite to eat, chat with Dan Scully, and we'll see you all next month. Thank you.